Tyler Crow, after a two-week hiatus, we are back. Well, my voice is mostly back. It's coming back. But most importantly, you and I are ready to talk about some solar stocks. We're going to talk about a solar stock, SunPower, that's down a ton. Stock used to be over $30 a share. Now it's about 2 bucks a share. Tyler and I are going to talk about why we think investors, even with the solar market kind of being in a mess and an opportunity when the cycle turns, we think investors should stay away from SunPower. But we have two other stocks that are also down a lot that we think investors should be looking at buying right now. Tyler, are you ready to have this conversation? I'm always ready to talk solar. Sun Power has always been kind of one that's been interesting to follow, maybe not quite as interesting to own, but certainly a story that we can hash out here. And for anybody who's curious as to why this thing is down more than 90% over the past three years. Well, it's a business that's always innovated. They've done some great things, but they failed to deliver value for investors, right? That's the core story. But we'll talk more about why we think that that could persist going forward. Before we get into the specifics on Sun Power and our two better solar stocks to buy, though, this video is sponsored by The Motley Fool. If you're looking for even more great stock ideas, you should go to our special link. It's fool.com forward slash unscripted. The Motley Fool's got a great deal for you. In addition to the two great stock ideas you're going to get from watching this video, go to that special link. The Motley Fool is going to give you its 10 best stocks to buy right now. Watch a video, go to that link. That's 12 great stock ideas you're going to get for free. Definitely check it out. Okay, Tyler. Let's talk about SunPower, just briefly what SunPower does today, why the stocks come down so much, and then why we're worried about it, and then the two stocks that we think are better ideas right now. SunPower is a, I, I, I believe, probably one of the more unique businesses in the solar industry right now, in that it is a, it's not a developer of residential solar. It's not a panel maker. They're kind of a facilitator of, you know, selling solar panels to residential homes. They have built a lot of kind of crafty tools to help people better understand like, you know, how much solar power is possible off of your roof. They have built up a network of independent contractors that will come and actually do the installation and things like that. And also kind of doing a little bit of the monitoring as well as maintenance sort of stuff to kind of keep your, your solar installation actually up and running as a, as a residential person, because I'm sure not all of us are trained electricians that can just kind of go up on the roof and start fixing panels, right? So the I, legacy of the business that, that allowed them to kind of build this business that they have today was designing and manufacturing solar panels, typically some of the most efficient solar panels on the market, which is important for rooftop solar because you have limited space to work with. But they spun that business off, right? That's Maxion now. It's a separate business that they still work with to supply panels. But they built, again, like you're talking about the relationships with all of these installers that they have and designing systems and developing some larger scale solar too. They kind of acquired all the, all the all of those skills along the way. But today, like you said, they're kind of the like they're the the piece in the middle that connects the, the re residential solar buyer with the right installer for the area, designing the system, implementing it, pricing it out, all of that kind of stuff, and then managing it on the back end. So that's that's kind of what they do. What's but what's the problem? What's what's caused the stock to fall so much? Well, being so intimately tied to the residential solar market. Uh, is going to be an especially challenging thing. We've talked about kind of panel manufacturers and people that are exposed to the utility side not being anywhere near as affected as some that are more on the, the residential side. Like we've explained in other videos talking about, let's say, Enphase or Solar Edge Technologies, anybody that's tied to residential where you've got, you know, high financing costs and things like that associated with actually bringing on a residential facility, you know, an eight, nine percent loan on a, a twenty thousand dollar installation is a heck of a lot harder to swallow than, you know, a five, six percent loan going there. So when when you add that up, the, you obviously have a bad backdrop. And then on top of that, SunPower has just in this past year, things have really started to go sideways for, for them in terms of just kind of like just call it like the the general management of the business. I think we can we can just call a spade a spade. They really have stumbled. Yeah. So for a long time, CEO of the company was Tom Werner. He was the one who was the, it kind of shepherded the business through this. We're really good at manufacturing panels where we have the best technology. We, you know, we think we can leverage this into this residential business. And then he stepped down after a while and the, 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 the new management's kind of really pushed towards this residential developer sort of business line didn't quite work out the way they wanted it to. And now Tom Warner is now back. Kind of, I 
can't remember if he's in the CEO suite, but he's certainly the executive chairman of the board. And mm-hmm. there's been a lot of kind of C-suite boardroom drama. Yes. Since. Tom Warner came back. He came back as principal executive officer. So he's not the founder of the company, but about as close to a founder as you're going to find that's involved with the company now. I was the CEO for 17 years and was the chairman of the board for a substantial amount of it. But he's back essentially. He's the de facto most important leader for this business now again. Yeah. So he's the, he's the shot caller now. And in addition to this, or kind of, I guess we could say subsequent to this leadership change, we started getting other disclosures from the company that just kind of showed how the previous management was either asleep at the wheel or not necessarily doing their job. In February, they basically put out a a notice saying like, hey, we don't think we can file our 10K in time after announcing our fourth quarter results. And it's it's April 29th as we're recording and they still haven't filed their 10K, but they did release a statement a couple weeks or at least a week and a half ago, if I remember correctly, basically saying that we found on April, on April 17th, I'm going to pull it up on the screen here. Yep. Yep. This is the SEC filing from April 17th, which essentially says we've got to go back and audit and restate a whole bunch of financials from different periods. And Tyler, this is always a red flag when a business does this. I do think you talked a little bit about it. It does seem like it's things that are more marginal, nothing that's going to be massively restated, but it's always a concern when a company hasn't been doing a good job of accurately doing things like reporting costs of goods sold over over periods of time. I mean, the the actual like disclosure that they say is like, hey, you know, we may have miscategorized a couple of spending items. You know, we deducted up here and when they should have been deducted here. We've, we're going to do some restructuring. We're going to do some, we're going to fix. And, you know, that all sounds well and good, but these are like basic accounting things. It seems like your junior accountant, you know, four or five steps down the line should be able to notice things like this, not just like get by your CFO and CEO that are reporting these things to the SEC. So look, it's like I said, if you read the disclosure, you can go, oh, well, that's not a big deal, right? That's just some miscat cost. It doesn't actually change the bottom line. But it, it, it kind of goes to a, a managerial sloppiness. And, you know, one of the things that at least me as an investor, and it's something I've, I've harped on for a long time, and I, I, I think I've, you know, may have converted a few people along the way, but like management matters. I know there's like the, the Warren yeah. Buffett, like, you know, find a business that can run, be run by an idiot because it's going to happen eventually. But even in that case, like there has to be a certain level of competence at the management level to operate the business. And this is just kind of one of those examples of such. I'll take it one step further, Tyler, before we pivot to the two stocks that we think are are certainly viable right now. And that's, I think it's especially true for businesses that operate in very cyclical industries like this, is that you need a steady hand at the wheel because you, it's really important to manage your financial profile when your financial results can change so much from one period to the next. And that's certainly been a problem for SunPower. And I think that's a big reason investors, besides the fact that they haven't delivered very good economic value for many, many years on a per share value, that's enough reason that investors should, if nothing else, just sit back and watch and observe before thinking about this as a turnaround opportunity. So Tyler, you and I both have some stocks we want to talk about as our alternatives to buy. I'll say this mine and I'll share mine second and you go you go you go first here. Mine is more on the risk reward opportunity. So maybe somebody that was interested in Sun Power is a risk reward. I have one that I think is a much safer risk reward investment. You've got one that's a little more of a kind of a pure value play. It's one that you and I both own. It's a business that's delivering really, really well, but it just seems like it's deeply, deeply undervalued. Yeah, we're we're really sticking with our brands here. So I'm gonna talk about Canadian solar. This is a mostly a solar panel manufacturer. The name's a little misleading because it's not really a Canadian company. They're mostly a Chinese panel manufacturer. They have some manufacturing in the United States and they're becoming a little bit more globalized, but principally it's a Chinese their, commodity. Their headquarters is in Canada. That is, they, they, Yes. On top of the panel manufacturing business, they also do development in-house. So rather than like, you know, a first solar who all they do is they sell their panels to a developer who's going to actually build the project, Sun Power, or excuse me, Canadian Solar has in-house development. A lot of solar panel companies used to do this and they decided it was a bad idea, but Canadian Solar keeps doing it and it makes it like 
it takes a cyclical lumpy business and makes it even more cyclical and more lumpy because, you know, as long as you're developing these assets, your costs are high, your capex is high, you're not bringing cash in the door. And then all of a sudden you sell it for a giant lump sum payment and then boom, your profits are way up in one quarter. It makes it a little bit harder to analyze, but it's becoming a smaller and smaller part of the business as panel manufacturing becomes a larger component. It keeps growing that business. And as of right now, it has about five gigawatts of backlog of production, maybe a year or two of actual production that they can you know, rely upon. And that's something that makes, I would say, like utility scale solar a little bit more attractive today than say, you know, residential, because you've got those long tail development projects in place and people aren't just going to shut down the minute that we start to see a change in interest rates. The re on top of it being a, a, a decent business, what is appealing to me, at least for this particular company is that right now it trades for about 0 0.4 times book value. So it, basically the, the assets on the book are trading for pennies on the dollar. It's price to earnings ratio is about four. And, you know, a lot of those things will say, oh, it's a distressed business. But you start to look at it and it's got $1.9 billion in cash versus $3 billion in debt. So it's got a relatively favorable net debt position. It's still, its profitability is decent enough that, you know, not exactly a business is going to shoot the lights out in terms of like high profitability. But even at that sort of like low expectations, this company looks way too cheap for anybody that's looking at this business, especially if we were to see a, a major upswing in renewable energy, which we've seen from time to time. Yeah. I, I would go so far as to move from, from if to when, because this is just, it's a very weak downturn and these downturns do happen. Of course, this one's exacerbated because of higher interest rates, but at some point the market will adjust. We know that there's still massive demand for renewables and on a cost basis, they're very attractive versus even some of the lower cost things like the newest natural gas, efficient natural gas. And Canadian solar is doing a lot more storage now too. And that's helping make solar fit in more applications too, right? For baseload applications as well. So I think everything Tyler said is true. It's a reason I own some and have, have continued to hold because I do think once the cycle turns, it's going to become a lot more valuable than it is today. Let's talk about something more that's on the risk reward side and is certainly, I would not want to think about as a value stock, Tyler, that's in phase. Um, this is one that you and I followed probably as long or longer than we've talked about companies like SunPower and, and, and Canadian Solar. In phase's business is twofold. Uh, the largest part of their business is the panel level electronics. So on every solar panel that goes on a rooftop or uh, any kind of distributed solar in most of the Western world now, it has a device on the, right on the panel that manages the power coming out of it and converts it to, to AC power. The grid operates on they're one of the leaders in that space. They also make storage for residential and small scale commercial that's becoming a larger part of their business. But just as we've seen with SunPower, which is very exposed to residential, Enphase, that's by far its largest exposure to is residential solar as well. So its business has plummeted. Revenues have fallen from $750 million a quarter to last quarter was around $260 million. So we're talking, you know, revenue falling by three quarters which is brutal, right, for any business to go through. But at the same time that's happened, their, their battery business actually continues to grow a little bit, which is a really attractive thing. Talking about those tailwinds that are there, and maybe the most attractive thing to me about Enphase is even with its business results coming down and it actually reporting an operating loss last quarter, the business has continued to generate positive free cash flow because they use contract manufacturing, so they've been able to scale that down, reshift some of their manufacturing from Europe into the U.S., to leverage some tax benefits to improve their cash flows and also to just drive costs out of their business. And, and that's really important to have that scalability in a cyclical industry. So even though the business has come down, they've been able to stay, live well within their own balance sheet, actually generate positive cash flow, even through this last quarter that could be the bottom. It looks like it might be like the worst quarter. I want to share on the screen one thing I think that is attractive. It does look like there are some signs that the solar residential solar business is turning. Their guidance for the second quarter is revenue of about $310 million at the midpoint, 290 to 330. So again, that's still well, well below Tyler what it was when they were pushing $700, $800 million plus a quarter, but it's better than it was last quarter. So starting to see some sequential improvement. Part of it is seasonality. I'll acknowledge that. 
but it's also some signs that maybe that the freeze on solar is starting to thaw and that business conditions are getting better. We've, they've proven their ability to continue to make cash flow at these lower volumes. They have an incredibly strong balance sheet. They have net cash. And I think they have over $1.7 billion in total cash. So they have plenty of money that they can put to work quickly to reaccelerate growth, bring more manufacturing lines online quickly when the market does start to open up more. And I think that's created a good opportunity to, for investors who are willing to still take on some risk. You don't have the margin of safety that you do with the Canadian solar that you're buying it for 43 cents on the dollar. You're positioning yourself really well in a business for when the cycle does turn to potentially be a massive winner when the secular story for, for residential solar does turn back to growth. 